And you're gonna, are you going to talk before? Yeah. On, on the, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Testing, testing, one, two, three. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I'll praise you in the valley, praise you on the mountain. I'll praise you when... Good morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday. All right, I'm a little closer this time. Seems like you can pick me up better. I'll praise you in the valley, praise you on the...
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good morning and welcome to Crossroads Presbyterian Church on this Palm Sunday as we begin our journey to the cross and the empty tomb. It is such a gift to gather for worship today. My name is Susan Seitzma Bratt and I serve as the senior pastor here at Crossroads. And if this is your first time or your first time in some time, I extend a warm welcome to you, and I invite you to check out our Connection Center following worship to learn more about our church. If you are wondering how else to get more connected, we have these cards in the pews you can fill out, or again, you can go to the Connection Center. And on the back side, we have a place to write prayer, concerns, or joys. Crossroads is a praying congregation. Our staff, our elders, those in our church lift up joys and concerns weekly. So you can write them on the card and place the cards in the basket or email the joys and concerns to prayers at crossroadspres.org. And if you'd like to be more intentional about prayer, we have a physical copy of the prayer list on our table in the Connection Center. We also have a half sheet available in the baskets as you come in and out of the sanctuary so you know what's happening in the coming week at Crossroads. Although we worship in different spaces, we worship together in spirit and truth. Throughout this season of Lent, we have been journeying to the cross with the disciple Simon Peter as our guide. And the words of the old hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing on Our Lips. As we enter our time of worship, let us start by tuning our heart to sing God's grace. Like many of us, Peter has a wandering heart, 
but he's always tethered to the love of God. In our passage from Scripture this morning, we will follow Jesus and Peter in an upside-down parade. Peter and the disciples will join the crowds, crying out, Hosanna, asking Jesus to save them as they begin their journey. So let us remember and sing together. you to rise and body your spirit for our call to worship. Sing songs of loudest praise. Hosanna. Hosanna. Sing songs that are unashamed. Hosanna. Hosanna. Sing songs without being afraid. Hosanna. Hosanna. Sing for the God of tomorrow and today. Hosanna. Hosanna. Let us worship the one worthy to be praised. together.
John tells us that the crowds gathered to praise Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem, singing and shouting with confidence. After describing the crowd, however, the gospel writer zooms in on the disciples and tells us that while the crowds were shouting praise at Jesus, the disciples were confused. The text says, the disciples did not understand what was happening. That's John 12, 16. A lot of our lives may look like this. Either we understand God's presence in our lives and we want to shout it from the rooftops, or we're standing on the side of the parade missing our chance to sing. That is why we need the prayer of confession, because life happens fast. And without a doubt, we have stood where the disciples stood. So let us pray, for we don't want to miss our chance to sing. Holy God, we want, we want to run into the streets and sing your praise. We want to be bold and unashamed of this good news gospel. However, too often we find ourselves standing against the wall. Too often we stay quiet. Too often we let others carry the song. Forgive us for the moments when we could lead the parade, but instead find ourselves standing on the sidelines. Show us which songs are ours to sing. Show us which parades are ours to lead. And then give us the courage and conviction to do both. With hope and honesty, we pray. Amen. Friends, no matter where you are on the parade route, whether you are waving palm branches through the streets or standing against the wall, quiet and cautious, Jesus marched for you. Jesus' love, his striving for justice and mercy, it was for you. You are included in this story, and nothing can ever change that. So hear these words and trust them deep in your bones. We have reason to sing, for Jesus Christ loved you yesterday. Jesus Christ loves you today, and Jesus Christ will love you tomorrow. You are forgiven, claimed, and sent to serve. Go out and sing. Go out trusting these words. Amen. So let us sing together with gratitude. of God's saving grace. And so we want to extend this peace and this grace that Christ gives to us. So the peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. Let us now greet one another and share the peace of Christ.
Well, before our children come forward, we have a few announcements to share with you. There is no Sunday school today. Instead, we invite you to stay for a congregational meeting very briefly after worship to elect our new slate of officers, uh, the new nominating committee as well. And they will all begin their service on July 1st. And directly following the congregational meeting, we have an all-church brunch in the CLC, which everyone is invited to, and free will offerings are accepted. Then this week is a holy week, and there is a lot going on. On Thursday, we have a Monday Thursday service where we will gather with worship and communion as we begin our journey to the cross and tomb. And there's no child care at that service. And then on Good Friday, join us for a service of darkness at 7 p.m. You may come early to hear the beautiful choral prelude and then stay and reflect during our wonderful Tenebrae Cantata. On Easter Sunday, join us in remembering Christ's passion and the resurrection at our sunrise service outdoors on the front lawn at 6.30. I will be there, Scott will be there, Pastor Susan will be there, come join us, the O'Connors will be there. Bring a chair and especially bring a blanket. Um, And then we have our festival music Easter Sunday service at 9 a.m. Remember to bring a cut flower for our Easter cross, it is so beautiful every year. We are investing in our students through our envelope fundraiser. It started last week at the Variety Show, and your giving goes towards student trips uh, for our young people where their lives are shaped by these great experiences. So look for envelopes in the narthex now through April 5th. You can choose an envelope that has a specific amount on it, um, or you can choose one that you can fill in for whatever amount you'd like. Thank you so much for supporting our students. On April 7th, we have another pep talk for parents. Many parents dread having the talk with their kids. And our next pep talk will equip parents to have age-appropriate conversations with children through their growing up years. These talks can build trust and confidence and help our kids really live into healthy understandings of themselves as children of God. And so join us for this discussion led by Dr. Jessica Minder and Pastor Scott on the book Sex and Faith, Talking with Your Child from Birth Through Adolescence. Uh, The book is by Kate Ott. And a comprehensive summary of the book can be found at the Children's Ministry Counter if you don't have time to read it by the 7th. We would encourage you to register in advance. Also on Sunday, April 7th at 3 p.m. in the CLC, we are really excited to host the former Governor Marty Schreiber for a conversation on caregiving and Alzheimer's. Governor Schreiber will be signing his book, My Two Elaines, and giving counsel and hope to all of us as we think about aging and those we love. Once again, please register so that we know that you'll be here with us. And now before our children come forward, I would invite you all to pick up the friendship pads and pass them down the pews, sign in, and take a look so that you know who you are worshiping with this week. As we begin, uh, we're going to watch a video. This past June, our children at Vacation Bible School acted out today's scripture passage for Palm Sunday. And it is one of the many wonderful parts of our amazing VBS, uh, which we'll talk about more after Easter. But we get a little reminder and preview of what's to come as we watch this fun take on today's story. Hello, and welcome to another exciting Jerusalem Day Parade. This year's parade is bound to be the best one yet. We have it all. Our first and only float is this state-of-the-art donkey. Standing at just 32 inches tall, this little guy is still a young one. Aw, isn't he cute? But it's not the float that's drawing the crowds here today. No, that would be the guy on the float. Is it the newest pop sensation? Is it the latest Broadway star? 
How about the cast of your favorite movie? No, it's even better. It's King Jesus. This guy has an impressive list of accomplishments. He's healed sick people, calmed storms, and even raised people from the dead. You know, I've heard that people have been waiting for him to make some kind of political move. Could this be it? Today, he comes as a king. Well, this crowd is going wild. They're throwing their coats onto the parade route so his donkey doesn't have to touch the dirty ground. They're waving palm branches to honor this king. They're cheering wildly, praising King Jesus. But not everyone is so excited today, folks. I see a few grumpy faces in the crowd. In fact, I have one right here. Sir, I saw you scowling during the parade. What seems to be the problem? This guy is acting like he's God. He shouldn't be letting people praise him. It's not right. Well, it wouldn't be right unless he really is God like he says. Folks, you won't believe this. Jesus is responding to the guy we just interviewed. He says the rocks would praise him if the people didn't. And there Jesus goes. With that, another successful parade comes to a close. Thank you for joining. Okay, we don't want rocks doing our job. So kids, come on forward, bring your palm branches with you. We have a great tradition here at Crossroads where we make sure that on Palm Sunday, uh, no inanimate object does our job of praising God. Oh no, we don't sit for this one. Everybody stand to your feet and we get to sing. Here we go. Ain't no rock. Four, five, six, or seven, you may head off to children's worship. Everybody else may sit. All right. Well, if you weren't awake, you are now, right? What a gift to have our kids leading us today. Before we hear God's word, please join me in prayer. God of grace, your word is like a song. 
It's the melody we long to sing. So as we return to your word once more, we would pray that you would allow us to sink into your song of grace, to surrender, to hear the truth in your word, to allow the cries of the crowd's hosannas to feel like our own, and to return to you with hands open, ready to surrender our lives to you. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we already heard our passage told so well from our children, so we'll hear it one more time just in case you forgot what today's story was. We're looking at John's version of Palm Sunday, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. And if you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you can turn to page 106. The next day, the great crowd that Jesus had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. But his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today we are making a turn as we close out our season of Lent and we journey to that last supper table, to the cross, and to the empty tomb of Easter. Today's story is so familiar, right? We grew up singing the songs and waving our palm branches. But I'd like to reflect on what this story might be about. This is a story about surrender. This is a story about trust. I'd like you to consider that word surrender this morning. And there's a couple of reasons why I'd like us to do this. The first is that it is Palm Sunday, a day that begins with the proclamation of Jesus' triumphant entry to Jerusalem, a day that points us towards Holy Week, when the crowds will praise him on this day, but by Friday, what are they yelling? Crucify him. And when those crowds turn on him, and when his beloved disciple Peter betrays him, and the Romans decide to crucify him, how does Jesus respond? Jesus doesn't fight back. He doesn't run away. He lets himself get arrested. He surrenders. Have you ever considered looking at Holy Week, walking through Holy Week, through this posture of surrendering? I'll be the first to admit surrender has some negative connotations, right? It means giving in, giving up, letting someone else get their way instead of you. But today is different. This parade is different, isn't it? As we know, Jesus has been teaching and talking all about his true purpose. He told his disciples, I'm going to seek and save the lost, but I'm also going to die and rise again and save you. I am the Messiah. And remember, Peter could see this. He called Jesus the Messiah, but then Peter struggled to accept what this meant. Oh, Jesus, you're not going to die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Remember that from a couple weeks ago? But for Jesus to make this journey to the cross, he has to surrender. How? It starts with the parade from Palm Sunday. Show of hands, have any of you been to a parade? Okay, lots of you, great. It's fun to sit and watch a parade, right? Maybe some of you went to the St. Patrick's Day parade here. It's fun to see floats and bands, to catch the excitement, to have candy thrown at you. Parades are times of celebration. Have any of you been in a parade? Any marching band friends? Yes, okay. Well, it's also quite something to be in a parade, right? You wear your marching band uniform, you march with pride, you play well. It's, it's a joy to be in a parade, right? And you can see the crowds when you're in the parade. And that's different, isn't it, to move from watching the parade to being in the parade. 
Well, historically, parades are not just times of celebration as they are for us right now, but they're times to gather folks together and make a display of power. Throughout history, armies have paraded either after war with the victory march, showing off their might, their troops, their tanks, or during times of conflict, armies have marched in parades to show their power, their might. Parades are all about victory, right? Being a winner. And you don't have a parade, though, when you're about to surrender, do you? No. You wave a flag, right? Or you quietly slink away. So what does surrender and parade have to do with one another? Well, it's the Passover, and the Romans are occupying this region, and this is the time when they allow all the Jews to come back to the temple to celebrate the Passover, which is the feast when they celebrate the passing over of the angel of death, God's provision to them when they were in Egypt. It's one of two times during this period in biblical history when the Roman authorities would allow all the Jews to come worship freely at the temple. Security is heightened. And every year at this time, Pontius Pilate, who's the ruler who typically lives on the beach in Caesarea Maritima, makes his way to Jerusalem. And every year at this time in biblical times, there is a parade with Pontius Pilate on his chariot, as you can see there. You see, the Romans loved a good parade. Their army could march in, rolling and showing the force. And if you're a Jew there for the Passover and you see this parade, what's your response? I'm not going to cause trouble, right? I'm not going to start a revolution. I'm going to get in line and worship and then go back home and, and, and stay safe. So we have a parade on one end of the city of Jerusalem with Pontius Pilate. And then we have this other parade taking shape. Word was spreading. People knew that Jesus was special. They hoped he might be the Messiah, the king, like David. He's fulfilling all these prophecies. Some in the crowd thought that Jesus would deliver him. He'd be a political leader, start a coup, overthrow the Romans. The crowds were gathering, and tensions were running high. Everybody thought Jesus might start a revolution. So how does Jesus choose to enter? If he's to be the counterpoint to Pontius Pilate, does he get a big white horse and a chariot to show power with power? No. Our passage tells us Jesus finds a young donkey, a colt. Has anyone tried to ride a horse or a donkey that is unbroken? Anyone here? Would you want to ride a donkey or a horse that's unbroken? No, it's going to buck you off. It's not going to know how to hold a rider. It's young. It's going to be wild and crazy. And Jesus picks this animal, a humble animal, to ride in on this parade. Why? Because Jesus is surrendering. He's trying to show and embody this upside-down kingdom he's been preaching and teaching about for the last three years of ministry. And everyone is projecting their image of who they want Jesus to be. Save us, they cry. Hosanna, they cry. We want you to go up against Pontius Pilate for the next battle royale. And what is Jesus saying in this moment? I'm not that. In fact, I'm quite the opposite. I'm not going to meet power with power. I'm going to meet power with weakness by surrendering. In this moment, Jesus is choosing yet again to trust his Father's plan, to embrace who he is as the Son of God, the Messiah, the suffering servant. This is not the Messiah that they're expecting. It's all upside down. And in this moment, Jesus is also fulfilling a prophecy from Zechariah 9, verse 9. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious, riding on the foal of a donkey, a colt. So Jesus' choice of this animal isn't just to show this he's surrendering and he's picking a weaker animal. He's actually saying, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. I am the Messiah, And yet I'm not the Messiah you think I am. And so we have this turning point 
in this parade. Jesus is saying, I'm surrendering to my Father's will. And what does the crowd do? They grab their branches from the trees. They put down their coats. Why? Again, we, we are reading this 2,000 years later. This is actually something done for a king. When a king was getting ready to be coronated, people would throw their coats and branches down on the path so that the king wouldn't walk on the ground. So again, we have this upside-down parade of a king coming in on the wrong side of the city, riding the wrong animal, and yet riding just the right animal and being welcomed. And yet, the crowd is saying, Hosanna, save us. Jesus will save them, but not in the way they think he will. What happens by Friday? The crowds will yell, crucify him. Peter will deny him three times, and, and the disciples will forget all that Jesus has been trying to teach them. Denial runs high, avoidance. Oh, how fickle we can be. And isn't that the paradox? Jesus, for us, keeps telling us who he wants to be as our Savior, conquering the powers of sin and death, not with more power, but by suffering by surrendering. The fact is, this wasn't going to be easy for Jesus. We know when he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane, he will wrestle. And yet, he surrenders. Knowing this about Jesus gives me some strength and courage, and I hope it does the same for you. Because chances are good that there's something going on in our lives right now some struggle, some back and forth, something that we really want to hold on to, just like the crowd. The crowd is yelling, save us, be a king for us, be powerful for us, kick those Roman butts to the curb. But that's not what Jesus is going to do, is it? The crowd has to surrender their understanding of Jesus, and Jesus has to surrender the pressure and the power that's been given to him. So I wonder, is there something in your life that you need to surrender? Some struggle, some back and forth, something you really want to hold on to. And you yourself in your prayers have gone to God and said, do I need to let it go? It could be anything. It could be a ladder that you're climbing, a ladder of success. Climbing that ladder gives you more money, more status, more power, freedom for your family, Sometimes you wonder, what would happen if you stopped climbing? If you stopped climbing with that hole in your heart that you're trying to fill by all the climbing, be filled? Maybe it's a dream you have that hasn't panned out. You had a picture of your future that has grounded you and kept you going for years, but something has happened. You thought your future would look like this, and now it looks nothing like that. And the question becomes, do you keep pursuing this future in your imagination? Or do you surrender yourself to the place where God has you? I don't know what you're struggling with right now. But I know we're all struggling with something at some point, holding on to something versus letting go. And the invitation as we make the journey to the table of betrayal to the cross on Good Friday and to the Easter tomb is for all of us to take some time to reflect. What do we need to let go of? What do we need to surrender so that we can make the journey with Jesus? Because when we surrender something valuable to us, something we're used to having, our lives will look different, they'll feel different, but we also know that this is good news. We're reminded today that through the act of surrender, in some ways we can't yet picture our lives might become an even greater reflection of God's grace. And you and I will know that it wasn't our work that got us to that place. It was God's work in our lives. In the name of the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of us all, amen.
Friends, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we sometimes misunderstand your purposes, and too often we fail to follow through on what we know to be your will. Oh, we can be fickle, misguided, afraid to step onto the new path you have for us. And yet, despite our halting faith, your spirit keeps stirring within us songs of hope and praise. Thank you, Lord, for never losing hope in us. Sustain us with a vision of who you truly are. For one day, all creation will shout the praises of your goodness and glory. Embolden us to carry these songs everywhere you send us, so that others' hearts may be stirred by your love for them. And Lord, shape our longings so that we might long to know you more fully, be changed more profoundly, and work ever faithfully toward the day when this world is transformed by your love. And even as we sing praises to you, the Prince of Peace, we're so aware of how elusive peace can be. We lament the conflicts in Ukraine, Gaza, and now Haiti, and the cheapening of human life happening there. We're discouraged by rising levels of distrust among fellow citizens and even between those who claim to follow you. And we know too many people who cannot seem to find peace within. And sometimes we even count ourselves among their number. So Jesus, as we walk with you through this holy week, we ask that you break what needs to be broken in us and in this world. Pride, self-righteousness, greed, ingratitude, our need to be in control, to be right, our desire to wound others as we have been wounded. So break us, we pray, as you wash our feet in the upper room. Wreck us as you die in agony for us on a cross. And then as your body, your broken body, is raised up and restored to life, May your spirit do a similar work in us. This Easter, help us to experience a love that makes us whole and new life that never ends. Lord, we pray this with grateful hearts for your sacrificial love that renews us still today. And we now stand to sing the prayer you taught your disciples. Today, we collect the one great hour of sharing offering. It's an offering taken to fund our Presbyterian efforts to rebuild after natural disasters, to provide food to the hungry, to build equitable systems in communities where poverty and oppression mar the image of God in those who live there. Our kids have been given greasy the fish coin banks, and those may be placed in the pool that is found in the narthex this morning. And for us in worship, we can find special envelopes next to the offering baskets in the back of the sanctuary. We can also give to one great hour of sharing via Realm or by going to the special offerings page on the PCUSA website. 
And if you brought with you a gift to support the ministry of Crossroads, you can place those in the offering baskets as you exit the sanctuary after worship. And now let us praise God with thanksgiving and joy for all of God's good gifts as we sing the doxology together. Let us pray. Generous God, just as creation responds to your presence, may we always respond to your goodness with praise. May the gifts we bring come from grateful and joyful hearts. May your heart be gladdened by our imperfect but well-intentioned efforts to say thank you. And may your spirit inhabit our efforts and use what we have to offer to bring peace to this world and to all people. Amen. Friends, now one more time, let us praise God with loud and joyful voices.
Friends, I invite you to stay in your pews for our quick congregational meeting. If you are a visitor with us, you're welcome to go to our Connection Center or head on over to brunch. But receive this blessing. Beloved wanderer, as you leave this place, may you carry your heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, to run to the tomb, to speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice saying, take heart, do not be afraid. Friends, you are called, you are blessed, and in all your ups and downs, you belong to God. Go in peace. Amen.